Welcome everyone to another episode of the Cryptographic Asset Show brought to you by CryptographicAsset.com. We are more than honored today to be sitting down with Graham Moore of Polymath Network. Thank you so much, Graham, for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Justin. So what's new in the security token space? It seems to be one of the few niches that exist that um, survived the ICO days and now exists amongst the DeFi world. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a ton of new stuff. Um, so for us specifically, the newest thing that's happened is we finally launched our purpose-built blockchain for security tokens called Polymesh. And so we were one of the first players in the world that started talking about security tokens back in September uh, kind of 2017. And then actually even earlier than that, uh, I got in in September 2017, but then earlier than that, kind of more like summer, spring, we started talking about security tokens. And initially, we were building all of our tech on Ethereum. You know, that's where everyone was building technology. They were building smart contracts on Ethereum. That's where the developers were. That's where the assets were. That's where everyone was creating these utility token things. Um, but what we noticed, especially as we started talking to more and more institutional players, was that Ethereum didn't work for them. And so we needed to build some purpose-built infrastructure for security tokens. And so that was Polymesh. And so we announced that back in 2019, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, and we finally launched Polymesh to the public uh, about two weeks ago. Can you tell us more about those two technologies? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in terms of what we built on Ethereum, uh, so we spearheaded what's now the most widely used security token standard in the world. It's called ERC-1400. And so some of the listeners of your show might be familiar with ERC-20. So ERC-20 is the most widely used standard for utility tokens. So things that might represent access to a protocol, um, something like that, you know, loyalty points, so, something like that in terms of a utility token. Um, and so ERC-20 was the most widely used standard. And we said, okay, well, how can we extend ERC-20? So making a backwards compatible implementation that allows actual financial securities to live on a blockchain. And so what you need are primarily things like transfer restrictions. So with securities, I, if I issue a security, I need to know who's holding that security at any point in time. You know, am I able to do business with them? Are they accredited? Uh, what jurisdiction do they live in? Um, so things of that nature are very, very important in terms of securities laws. And so we helped build uh, a lot of that technology into what's ERC-1400, and that's now the most widely used standard on Ethereum. And, but so it, it works, right? You can use Ethereum and you can have transfer restrictions and you can know who your shareholders are, you can know who your bond holders are or your revenue share agreement holders are, uh, but it's not ideal. It's not the most ideal scenario for institutions to actually use this technology. And so we kept hearing that there were problems with Ethereum uh, from the institution's viewpoints. You know, these are the, the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgans of the world, uh, these large institutions who are going to use this brand new technology for the first time. And we kept hearing that they didn't like five main things, uh, governance, identity, confidentiality, compliance, and settlement. So we kept hearing that they didn't like those things with Ethereum. And so we whiteboarded and researched and talked to everyone we could in the whole entire industry, uh, researched for, for years, even uh, architected for years, and then finally built uh, what we think is a really good solution for security tokens, which is Polymesh. And how far has the security token industry come since you entered it, which I believe was around 2016, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, so, so 2017. So I mean, 2017, there was essentially zero security tokens, you know, uh, kind of beginning of 2018, we saw a few, uh, maybe maybe at the very tail end of 2017, we had a couple, there was, uh, there was blockchain capital, which actually is still a security token and, and going very, very strongly. I think if you if you uh, own blockchain capital uh, fund shares back then, I think you've outperformed pretty much uh, the very broad cryptocurrency market as a whole, Coinbase being, being a huge uh, part of that as well, uh, being in the blockchain capital holdings. Um, so I think it was blockchain capital and science were kind of the two security tokens that existed uh, once Polymath uh, got started and, and really taking shape in the security token landscape. And so that was, you know, a couple million dollars worth of tokens that exist. There's now billions of dollars of security tokens. And so right now, the largest tokenization that's live, that, that's uh, available for people to invest in, uh, that people can actually take a look at that lives on chain is uh, a token tokenization by a company called Red Swan which I'm also uh, on the advisory board of. So Red Swan has tokenized $2.5 billion of commercial real estate. And so very, very exciting to see that where we've gone from a world three, four years ago of 
a couple million dollars of security tokens. Now we're seeing billions of dollars of security tokens. And I think I saw last week, there's another new uh, real estate security token with billions of dollars. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting there's going to be another one coming, you know, in the next month or two uh, with a billion dollars. And so there, there's now finally the comfort with a lot of these firms of entering the space, using security tokens for significant amounts of money. So it's no longer in the you know, testing phase of well, let's try this with $20,000 uh, of a bond, um, or let's try this with a million dollars. It's now let's use this for an actual real world implementation with real players, with real money at stake, with billions of dollars. And so it's, it's come a huge way in the last four years. And I believe that there was a partnership between Red Swan and Polymath, if I'm not mistaken. So they're, so they're using our technology. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our legal team hates the word uh, partnership. Um, they're using our technology, right? So what Red Swan does is they use the token studio, which is a user interface that we've built that lives on top of our SDK, our software developer kit, which lives on top of the, the kind of lower level plumbing that we've built for security tokens. And so all of that infrastructure. And so Red Swan goes on the user interface, they click some buttons, and they create a token. And then they can manage that token on an ongoing basis, ensuring that they can comply with whatever regulations they have to comply with. Tell us more about what's going on in the security token space, because I feel like it's one that's not been in the spotlight, but is one that has been chugging along. And as dating back many years now, I think as late, as early as like 2014, the notion of a security on a blockchain has been pretty fundamental to the I guess, development of a technology stack that serves as an alternative to the centralized infrastructure that exists today, the centralized institutions. And I would argue that this concept goes back to Patrick Byrne at uh, T0 even. He was talking about recreating uh, essentially Wall Street on the blockchain. So what else do people need to know to get caught up to security tokens at the end of 2021? Yeah, I mean... What people need to get caught up on, I think one would be uh, El Salvador's volcano bond. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that. So El Salvador, uh, I believe they're issuing a $1 billion bond, um, which is going to help uh, them to buy Bitcoin with that bond and also improve their infrastructure for mining. And so, again, a billion dollars coming onto a blockchain. So they're actually using, I believe, uh, Blockstream's liquid for that. Um, but so it's really cool to start seeing this industry actually take, take shape, where, as I mentioned, you know, we're no longer in the let's test this thing out with $50,000. Let's actually put a billion dollars on chain and use the chain as our golden source of truth of what actually uh, are the covenants for this bond, you know, who are the owners of this bond and governing actual real world live aspects uh, of all things, uh, capital markets and doing that on chain. And so that's kind of one big thing that's happening. And then we're starting to finally see a lot more banks move past the, the kind of POC phase as well. Um, a really cool thing that's happened recently was, uh, was SockGen. I'm not sure if you saw this. SockGen, uh, they made a proposal for MakerDAO. And so part of what they did is, is SockGen issued a bond on Ethereum. And so then they went to MakerDAO and they said, hey, MakerDAO, you should actually use this bond as collateral for DAO. And so very, very cool as we're getting more and more actual real world financial securities on chain. I think what that's going to do is bring a lot more stability, uh, especially to the DeFi markets. And so what I mean by that is today, what is the collateral in MakerDAO for DAI? You know, it's USDC, USDT, and then, you know, BAT and a few other tokens. You know, what would you rather have in terms of collateral for a loan? Basic attention token, which is a, a token associated with, with a, a web browser, which I don't really know what it does. Um, maybe I think it gets you to not watch ads or a $1 billion bond that's backed by Bitcoin and real world assets that are controlled by a government. You know, maybe some people would actually say, you know, they don't want the bond that's controlled by the government. They would prefer the basic attention token. But I think the point here is, as we get more and more actual real world financial securities on chain, it brings a lot more stability to the system where a lot of these collateralized positions are no longer uh, being propped up or, or being held by, you know, these kind of random utility token things, which of course, some of them have a ton of use and some of them are very important and some of them are going to be very important in the future of, of finance. Um, but a lot of people still want, you know, the, the billion dollar bond that has real world assets that are backing it. Let's read a little bit about that volcano bond. So El Salvador has struck a deal with crypto firms, Blockstream and iFinex to advance its efforts in the Bitcoin market. The country is set to issue so-called Bitcoin bonds to quote, accelerate hyper Bitcoinization and bring about a new financial system on top of Bitcoin, according to Blockstream. 
El Salvador could issue $1 billion worth of Bitcoin bonds via Blockstream's liquid network, as you said. The proceeds of the bond issuance could support the development of volcano-powered Bitcoin mining. Quote from Blockstream, this bond is offering something we think will be attractive to a wide range of investors, ranging from cryptocurrency investors, investors seeking yield, hodlers, and ordinary people. Hyper-Bitcoinization uh, refers to essentially a, a new infrastructure built on Bitcoin, a financial infrastructure. People are apparently calling this a, quote, volcano bond. So any other comments on the uh, what's going on in El Salvador in terms of, I guess, DeFi technology or generally, as well as the volcano bond? Yeah, I mean, El Salvador has just obviously been uh, crazy in the news recently, um, and, and for good reason. Um, I think what they're doing there is really, really exciting. And so it, Bitcoin City obviously is another thing uh, that, that's worth mentioning. And so I think that the volcano is sort of at, at the base of the volcano, I think is where Bitcoin City is being set up, this quote Bitcoin City, um, where I think there's no income tax, uh, there's no capital gains tax. Um, th there's a bunch of things where I, I think that this presentation where there was you no know, zero, 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 zero percent tax on everything. Really, there's only sales tax going on in the city. Um, and on top of that, in El Salvador, I think the price of achieving citizenship right now is something like three Bitcoin. And so El Salvador is doing, doing some really cool things where we're starting to see the first legitimate jurisdiction attempt to captivate Bitcoiners and attempt to provide them a place where they can call home without, um, without feeling like the government hates them it is kind of the most blunt way that I can think of putting it, where El Salvador is saying, oh, you like Bitcoin? We actually like Bitcoin too. You know, we, are, we do not have Elizabeth Warren here telling you that Bitcoin is evil or Bitcoin is going to crash markets or Hillary Clinton going on videos saying that Bitcoin is going to be manipulated by China and Russia and it's bad and we should ban it. You know, so I think El Salvador is making a really smart move there. And it's really only a matter of time before we start seeing more countries take that exact same route where they're going to say, wow, look at El Salvador. They just, they just acquired, you know, let's call it 10,000 new citizens who are going to be paying taxes, whether they're paying zero in income tax and zero in capital gains tax, they're still going to be providing resources to the local economy. You know, they still have to eat food. They still have to maybe buy a car. They still have to take pay for their surfing lessons or whatever it is that people would pay for in, in El Salvador. And other countries are going to want a lot of those people as well. And so we're finally starting to see the beginning aspects of this where jurisdictions around the world feel the need to compete for citizens. And for so long, it's, it's really been the opposite way where you can lock in citizens to your country pretty easily by forcing them to pay exit taxes. Um, and really, you don't have to provide services that are that great because you know your citizens are just going to stay where they are you know they work for a certain company and they have to stay in that jurisdiction but now with the internet now especially since COVID accelerated the adoption of working from home i can work anywhere in the world uh really where i want to live is my choice and jurisdictions around the world now have to compete for me and that's a really really exciting thing that, that el salvador is really pushing any plans of moving to el salvador <laughs> uh visiting definitely um, so I haven't been yet. Uh, there's a strange thing where Canadians love going to Costa Rica right now. I think there's like no COVID restrictions or something in Costa Rica. And so uh, a lot of people that I know are, are going to Costa Rica or moving to Costa Rica even. Um, I, I definitely have plans to visit El Salvador. I have not been yet to kind of Bitcoin Beach or the proposed Bitcoin city yet, but that's probably on my list for 2022 for sure. In terms of moving there, um, I, would, I would have to convince my girlfriend. Uh, so we'll see how that goes or you know, maybe I'll do know, one month there, one month off type thing. But yeah, definitely want to visit next year. I have some convincing to do over here. I'm thinking maybe like uh, Idaho's in the winter and uh, El Salvador. No, Idaho in the summer, El, El Salvador. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now society, society, SOCON, you mentioned uh, what they are up to. And so in a proposal that's in September on MakerDAO's governance forums, French multinational banking giant, SockGen submitted an application for the decentralized finance lending platform to accept on-chain bond tokens issued by the bank as collateral for stable coin die loans, a particular loan. This loan, mediated between a number of legal entities and third parties in a somewhat complex legal architecture, would be for up to 20 million in DAI, likely the largest step towards institutional adoption of DeFi to date. The application was submitted by SockGen and uh, 
Sockchain has been a leader on proof of concepts, experimenting with blockchain assets for years, and even issued bond back tokens on the Ethereum blockchain as far back as 2019. Can you speak more to uh, perhaps this uh, particular uh, example or Wall Street or big banks generally and their adoption of DeFi technology that you've seen? Yeah. Um, so so I, I wish I could talk more about kind of where, where Polymath is involved in that, but a lot of that stuff is still sort of under wraps. Um, but you know, coming soon, the, there will be uh, some pretty exciting things. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, Sockchain is definitely the furthest ahead in terms of DeFi specific um, initiatives that they've been working on and that they've actually put out into the wild. You know, that's not on their own private Hyperledger implementation or something. Um, you know, that's on public Ethereum. And so that's really, really cool to see. And, and that's part of why we at, at Polymath, you know, we, we could have gone the route of just building a private blockchain. You know, we could have used our three quarter or something like that, or build, uh, built our own private Hyperledger implementation and said, hey, banks, you know, this is completely private. This is what you're, you're completely comfortable with. Come use this. But, but that's really not where we see the future as. Um, and so that's, that's part of why Polymesh is public. Um, so it's a public blockchain. Um, it's permissioned meaning you have to pass a KYC process to use it. And the node operators are regulated financial entities, but it's still public. And so that's a really cool step that we're going to start seeing uh, as more and more banks on board to Polymesh and more of them use it for similar things like what Sockchain's using. Uh, that, that's going to be some really cool stuff. And in, in terms of that, you know, we just saw City. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this. I think this was either maybe two days ago. Um, City announced that they're hiring, I think, a thousand people um, specifically for crypto. Um, so it's not necessarily DeFi stuff. Maybe they're working on a custody product for Bitcoin. Maybe they're working on an ETF with, with an ETF provider. Um, we don't know exactly what they're hiring for. Um, at least I haven't looked at the, the job postings specifically, but that, we're going to start seeing that more and more. Um, we saw really in terms of, let's call them the legacy financial institutions. I think the furthest ahead in terms of anything would probably be Fidelity. Um, where Fidelity started building Bitcoin custody a very, very long time ago um, and offering ETH custody a long, long time ago. Um, and now we've seen the sort of upstarts that are from the legacy world, like NYDIG, um, that are really starting to take a big market share as well, and Galaxy, of course. And so I think really this is only going to accelerate. There's really no chance at this point now in 2021, November 26, 2021, where it, it's just impossible for me to forecast something where the world goes, oh, okay, yeah, no, we tried the Bitcoin experiment. We tried the DeFi experiment. We tried the security token experiment. Yeah, no, this stuff, this stuff isn't good enough. Well, let's go back to the old world. You know, it's just so obvious that we've reached the tipping point, which, is, which has been so exciting for me. And of course you, you know, we've been around the space for um, a number of years now. And, and there were times, you know, in 20, 2014, 2015, when I first started getting into Bitcoin, where I'm thinking, yeah, maybe this will work. Let's see. I don't know. Let's have fun. But you know, six years later, I think we've reached the tipping point at this uh, at this juncture, and there's no way that we ever go back. For me, the tipping point was March 2020, and when that happened, and the entire world changed, and lockdowns started taking place. Um, I first of all, I foresaw economic problems beyond my wildest imaginations, perhaps relegated to the history textbooks of what might happen after uh, such effects. But it was really at that point where I thought there's so much chaos going on now. There's so much changing that it's really probably become at least Bitcoin's time. And we, while, while still probably referred to as an experiment, as the developers of Bitcoin have done many times before, uh, especially the original developers, Mike Kern always used, referred to it as an experiment before he left the industry. And then Jeff Garzik also, who uh, was an original early Bitcoin developer, who then started Block and, and is working on, on broader blockchain projects, have always referred to it as an experiment. So while we still may be in that experiment phase, I do think that we've certainly like evolved into a, the next phase, which I think is a, certainly a hot experiment, if you will. So now we're live in many different ways from uh, some of the examples we spoke to uh, just now you spoke to, particularly with El Salvador, I think that was certainly the next phase. We saw this phase where Fortune 100 companies were coming in, MicroStrategy, Square, and others who were purchasing Bitcoin for their balance sheets. And then we saw the nation, state, nation states entering, uh, at least in the form of El Salvador. And I think that certainly, um, at the very least, El Salvador's brand is much better than it was before he made that decision uh, about a year ago. 
Um, so it depends that, on who you talk to. I guess if you speak to a, a Paul Krugman, he might not be a big fan, right? Yeah. Or the IMF. Or the IMF. So, but you know what? I mean, that even spat with the IMF. I mean, that reflects interestingly for the rest of us who are like, well, you know, maybe El Salvador, maybe Bukele is the uh, George Washington of El Salvador, as Mike Nicolona Bloomberg uh, Strategies was talking. He came on this show and he was talking about the El Salvador situation. And he can say, look, we can take two different routes here, kind of shrug off El Salvador and say, hey, whatever, it's not a big deal. Uh, they've got a bunch of issues still. Or we can say that he's the George Washington of Latin America. So I'm going to take the, he takes the La George Washington of La Latin America, I guess, route. And plays out that thought experiment to think what might be the ramifications of El Salvador's change. And the ramifications are uh, essentially that there's a domino effect. The U.S. is really familiar with domino effects. We, we spent the post-World War II uh, era trying to stop the spread of communism, that one country would turn communist and then another would and another would and another would. That was essentially the basis of our entire foreign policy for like 70 years. So now we've got the same situation in Central America. Will we see a domino effect? From El Salvador to other countries. And I think, as you stated, the likelihood is high. Now, Patrick Byrne always talks about that he was speaking about, at least, that he was looking to set up a alternative if civilization stack, if you will. Like he's looking at these main pillars of civilization and wondering, can we put them on a blockchain? And that was an experiment that he was doing all along. So he was concerned with the uh, is uh, I don't I forget the name of the institution with that he was looking to replace at T zero like the DC the DTCC the DTCC and then yep. he also was working in the voting uh, um, decentralized voting industry was what he was uh, attempting to do so in Burns mind he was trying to set up an empire of just like alternative decentralized technologies for if the centralized system failed or or entered into a, a serious crisis, people would have these alternatives. Now we're seeing that essentially play out. Byrne says it's too late. He says that like, we're not gonna have this infrastructure built in time for this thing uh, if it explodes. He's, he's of the opinion it's like exploding, imploding now. As are many, the economic news since last time we spoke has really kind of kicked up a notch. At any rate, as you mentioned, like we really moved into this like hot period. We've moved beyond proof of concept do you have any further thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think on, on kind of the DTCC stuff with, with Patrick Byrne, it's, it's really interesting. And I think Patrick became very excited and passionate about this subject when I think there was something like more than 100% of the float of uh, overstock shares are being shorted. It was something like that. And then he went, how is this possible? You know, it makes no sense. And so naked shorting was a huge thing that he, that he was trying to go after and trying to stop which was how can people bet against someone's company when they don't have any interest in it and there's actually no shares that are backing it. And so that, that was a really, really interesting thing. And one thing that could potentially be remedied by this open, transparent financial system where everyone can actually see what's going on under the hood. And that, that's one thing that, that's, that I've been very excited about as well in terms of security tokens and, and how a lot of this can be made better. And so so I, I had an, an op-ed in Fortune. This was maybe a few months ago, and it was about GameStop. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of people got very, very angry when Robinhood, for example, said you're not allowed to uh, buy GameStop, um, and you can only sell GameStop shares. You know, that to a lot of people that aren't really in the financial world, they go, "Well, that's market manipulation. You can't do that. How can all these brokers kind of gang up together?" I think there were more, and it wasn't just Robinhood. It was it was many different brokers that said. You can only sell this stock. You can't buy the stock. So what happens to the price? Obviously it goes down, right? When people can only press the sell button, the stock is gonna go down in price. And so it seems kind of crazy when you think about it. Your stocks are not your stocks. You know, They are locked into this thing called the DTCC or they're locked into your broker's account at a custodian somewhere. You do not own those. There is a piece of paper that links to another piece of paper that links to another piece of paper that links to another piece of paper that's in an Excel spreadsheet somewhere that says you own this stock. 
but you don't really own it. You know, you don't, you can't have custody over your own stocks. It's very, very hard to do that because it's almost impossible to trade on any of these trading infrastructures like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or these alternative trading systems. And so one of the really cool things that's going to happen with security tokens is you can actually have custody of your own financial assets. And so that's very, very cool in terms of what you can actually do and the benefit, the benefits that it proposes in a situation like, for example, if you're a broker that you're dealing with says you cannot buy this stock, you can only sell this stock, you can say, okay, no thanks, you are not my broker anymore, click a button and now plug in somewhere else and make a trade with someone else who is willing to either buy or sell that asset with you. And so having self-custody over financial assets is really, really cool. And that's one of the things that Bitcoin pioneered was you can now have digital ownership of something of value, whether it's a token that's being created through a proof of work mining system uh, that eventually can represent money or some type of gold 2.0, or whether it's a token that's associated with a protocol that lives on top of the internet, or whether it's a stock or a bond or a piece of real estate. And so having fully digital representations of value that are natively digital that you can custody yourself is going to change the financial system in ways we, we still haven't figured out. But one of the ways is people actually having control over their own assets and not having to succumb to these centralized third parties that decide what you can and can't do, where you are locked in and you cannot escape. You wrote in Fortune, the current process for trading stocks is archaic. While other industries have grown into the internet age with updated technology and processes, Wall Street is still operating on underlying technology that was built in the 70s. Trading as it currently stands requires a third-party broker to facilitate transactions, leaving brokerages in control of buying and selling instead of the people who actually own the stocks. This has worked in the past, but when you have situation when you have a situation like the recent GameStop snafu, it doesn't. And when social media gets involved, this will likely keep happening unless a change is made. Now, tell us about this uh, op-ed and, and what inspired you to write it. Yeah, it, it was this whole idea where it, it makes no sense now that we have blockchains that we cannot own our own financial securities. You know, And so when I have Bitcoin, I, I could rely on a third party to use that. And many people do. And that's totally fine. I, I'm not. I'm sort of of the not your keys, not your coins uh, type philosophy, but I understand that some people, they don't want to secure their own seed phrase. You know, they don't want to have those 24 words somewhere and, and trying to hide them and figuring out how to, how to shard those keys properly or potentially using a multi-sig setup. Some people just want to go, hey, you know what, Fidelity, you've custodied trillions of dollars over the years. Just, you know, take my Bitcoin, hold it for me safely. I might want it back in a few years and I'll enter my passcode. And maybe you'll check my ID and you'll confirm with that I still have my cell phone number and then I can, I can have my assets that way. But some people don't want to do that. And for me personally, you know, I custody my own Bitcoin. I don't want to have my Bitcoin sitting with, with Fidelity or, or sitting with uh, Nidig or whoever. And it's not because I don't trust them. It's just that centralized third parties, and this is a Nick Sabo thing and, and many others, trusted third parties are security holes. You know, you have no idea what's going to happen with those assets and they are not yours anymore. And I, I had this example recently um, where I had some, I had a few assets that I was just earning a yield on that were sitting in a third party. And I wanted to make a, a quick movement of them because I wanted to shove them into something that was paying, you know, like uh, one of those 8,000% uh, APY yield farming things. So I really, I wanted to draw my assets out and then shove them in there before this timer ran out on the kind of the bonus period before 12 hours. So I go, okay, withdraw assets. And then I say, okay, we're going to send you an email to confirm that you are who you say you are. I go, okay. So I go in my email, I click confirm. And then I says, okay, thank you for confirming. We will let you withdraw the assets in 24 hours. You know, so are those my assets at that point? Not really. You know, they're sitting with someone else and they have a piece of paper in an internal database that says, ultimately these are Graham and we, Graham's and we can let him take them out if we want him to, but you know, let's make him wait 24 hours. And so that's very similar to the legacy system. And there's not really any benefit to doing that where I still have to beg this third party to say, hey, please give me my own stuff. You know, and, and that's part of what's so exciting about everything in the Bitcoin space and crypto and security tokens overall is you don't have to be at the behest of this third party to say, hey, please give me my stuff. You know, you just, you have it yourself and you can do whatever you want with it. There must be some benefit for holding the tokens for 24 
or cryptocurrencies for 24 extra hours that they've thought through on the other end in the event of X. If X happens, then we were going to have some issues here. So now I want to uh, dig a little deeper into this article still. You wrote, in a security token world, if an app like Robinhood doesn't want to play ball and restricts trading like it did with GME, investors would still have the option to trade outside a brokerage or with any brokerage that meets their needs by instantaneously taking their business and assets elsewhere. Security tokens can both protect investors and solve the antiquation problem, opening up trading to anyone that meets compliance requirements at any time. The stock market doesn't need to be limited to a small number of exchanges located in specific countries. It can be a globalized system built on a decentralized technology. It's a radical idea, but I'm not the only one that sees this as the only real solution to the problems plaguing the industry. Take angel investor and former Coinbase CTO, Balaji Srinivasan. Balaji, Balaji Srinivasan, yeah. Srinivasan. I, yeah. So many stuff, so much stuff I hear in this industry. I never hear it. I only read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On Twitter last week, he called on the Securities and Exchange Commission to embrace security tokens, claiming that the problem isn't that some cryptos may be securities. The problem is that all securities aren't yet cryptos. He's right to say this. Legitimizing security tokens would make investors less wary of using them, which will shift the balance of power back to the investors themselves rather than monolithic centralized gatekeepers. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to go on a little rant. It's not exactly what... Um, go for it. It's not exactly... Uh, what Noam Chomsky was saying yesterday on the radio, I was listening to the radio here when I was going to the airport to pick up some family for Thanksgiving and Noam Chomsky was being interviewed by Ralph Nader and he was talking about corporations and how corporations should be run by the workers. And uh, I was like, man, this doesn't make any sense to me. Now with Chomsky, if you get too triggered by any one thing he says, you're going to miss a good point that comes uh, eventually. So it's important just to like not think things through like how do workers like control a corporation and they vote on the directors because it's like I'm at, I, I think about a family like if you have a family and, and the kids get to vote on everything then there's gonna be a lot of play time there's gonna be a lot of play time in that family I have a feeling and so now you're mentioning here now a shift of the balance of the power back away from essentially the centralized gatekeepers in a, in a monolithic monolithic institution to the investors so Again, we have like decentralization of actors too. This technology is making possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think an important point to to note there is, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. You know, if you like your TD Ameritrade account, just keep it. You know, keep it exactly the way it is. If you if you like your Charles Schwab account exactly the way it is, keep it exactly the way it is. Those companies will continue to offer those services and, and charge you fees. The point here is that innovation always provides more choice to the consumer, which ultimately benefits everyone. And so the same thing, you know, if you want to buy the Sunday morning newspaper and you want a, de a delivery person to come bring it to your doorstep and drop it on your doorstep, newspaper companies will still do that. You know, you can still do that, that if that's the way that you want to engage with the world in terms of news and that's how you like receiving your news and, and you like reading it on, on the tactile piece of paper. Um, but the internet made it so that you don't have to do that. You, know, you can just look at a piece of glass and the glass shows you whatever you want in terms of news anywhere, anywhere in the world, updated instantaneously in real time with any sort of bias you want. Um, and so that's the really exciting thing about this whole entire space is that consumers are being given more choice. And what a lot of people have in terms of roadblocks in their mind is, is when people who are, are really hardcore Bitcoiners and, and the sovereign individual type people is when they start saying, yeah, and you're going to custody all of your own assets yourself. You're going to be your own bank. And then some people go, oh, well, I don't want to be my own bank. Okay, Bitcoin is bad. That's stupid. No, but it's like, no, you still have the option to have your, your Chase account, you know, and Chase account, Chase is going to implement uh, the ability to have Bitcoin in it at some point. Or TD is going to have the ability to just hold your Bitcoin in there alongside your dollars. Like, don't worry. If that's the way that you feel comfortable, you can still do the same thing you've always done. But just because you want to do that old, old way thing and you're not comfortable with the new technology doesn't mean that it's bad. More choice is always better for the end consumer because it gives uh, them the opportunity to express their needs the way they want. And it generally always brings price down as well. In this article, you conclude uh, at the end of it, the best part that 
The best part is that this isn't a far off dream for the future. The technology already exists. Countries like Singapore and Germany are already ahead of the US by greenlighting the tokenization of securities. I've long believed that all securities will move to the blockchain by 2040. Recent events have just accelerated the inevitable shift. I want to talk a little bit more about news at Polymath as we uh, come to uh, the, the final uh, kind of segment of this uh, discussion, which thank you for joining us today. So on October 20th, 2020, Polymath announced that Coinbase Custody, a US-based qualified custodian specializing in digital asset custody for institutions, has been added to the Polymath service provider marketplace. So first things first, can you tell us what the Polymath service provider marketplace is? Yes, yeah, so the idea here is Polymath is not all things to all people. Uh, and we are also not a regulated entity. So what we do really, really well, better than anyone else in the entire industry, in my opinion, is we build base layer technology for security tokens. So building the infrastructure so that security tokens can be created, managed, issued, and all the other things that uh, no one else wants to build in terms of how can you make it really easy to, to make a dividend payment? How can you make it really easy for on-chain shareholder voting? How can you make it really easy so that someone can click a button and say, I don't want a single user or entity to have more than 49% of my outstanding tokens. You know, so all of that kind of infrastructure, really base layer, focused on compliance, we build that very, very well. What we don't have is a custody license. We are not a broker dealer. Uh, we're not a transfer agent. Um, we are not a KYC provider. And so what we do is we build this base layer technology, and then we rely on an ecosystem of providers to focus on what they do really, really well. We build base layer infrastructure better than anyone else, in my opinion. Coinbase builds the, some of the best custody infrastructure in the whole entire world. Uh, there are the best KYC providers in the whole world. There are some of the best broker dealers in the whole entire world. So what we do is we don't say we own the whole entire stack. We do every single service for every single person. We have every single license in the whole world. We rely on those third parties. So Coinbase is one of those providers that focuses on custody um, and they have the ability to do that for security tokens. And so I mentioned earlier, uh, Red Swan, tokenizing $2.5 billion in commercial real estate, Coinbase is custodying uh, some of those tokens. And so it's been really cool to see how the interaction works with all of these different parties in the capital markets ecosystem, where it's not just one company that kind of is the be all and end all for one uh, institution and for one issuer, the issuer can pick and choose who they think is the best provider at each different aspect. And so they might choose Polymesh in terms of their issuing infrastructure for a blockchain. Then they might use someone like Coinbase for custody. Then they might use uh, someone like Intoro to be the broker dealer for their offering. Then they might use someone like NetKey to do KYC for their offering. And so it's really cool to see how all of these different kind of Lego pieces fit together in the world of capital markets where we focus on what we do best and these other players focus on what they do best. So now the announcement is Polymath users now have access to Coinbase's secure and battle-tested custody storage while minimizing onboarding friction on all sides. Quote, institutions adopting digital asset solutions need an ecosystem that provides a comprehensive suite of tools, said Stephen Capaza, Coinbase's institutional coverage group. Quote, users are looking for a balance of regulatory compliance, asset security, and intuitive technology, and we are eager to continue adding new assets and growing the crypto economy. Can you tell us more about this particular announcement? Yeah. Um, so, so as I mentioned, it's all about growing the ecosystem. Uh, that's a really big, that's a really big aspect of what we focus on at Polymath is getting the most institutions, uh, the most issuers, most investors that are all excited about using uh, the security token technology, building the best base layer tech we possibly can. That makes it easy to follow compliance. That makes it easy to trade. That makes it easy to issue. That makes it easy to manage. And getting best in class institutions on board with that is really, really important. So Coinbase obviously being one of those. Uh, and then there's a number of other amazing custodians that we work with, broker dealers, KYC providers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then now Coinbase Custody integrates the ERC 1400 standard with this announcement. Spearheaded by Polymath, ERC 1400 has been widely adopted in the industry and provides a consistent framework to unite market participants. As a result, ERC-1400 tokens can onboard to Coinbase custody quickly and compliantly without additional technical due diligence. Can you speak to ERC-1400 standard and why people should know about it? Yeah, so ERC-1400, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, a bit 
briefly earlier. Uh, so ERC-20 is the most popular utility token standard. And so what we said when we were building our technology early on was how can we extend ERC-20 to make it regulatory compliant for actual securities? And so ERC-1400 is a backwards compatible standard for security tokens themselves. So it has concept of things like transfer restrictions, volume transfer uh, ownership restrictions, uh, freezing tokens, force transferring tokens, burning tokens, uh, all things that don't really exist in the ERC-20 spec. And so how we came about building ERC-1400 in the first place is we had something called the Security Token Roundtable. Uh, this is back in 2018, where we got everyone we possibly could uh, into a room together for one week where we asked them, what does a standard for securities need to look like? And so these were KYC providers, broker dealers, custodians, uh, lawyers that were formerly at the ICC. And we also got uh, Fabian Vogelsteller, who was uh, one of the authors of ERC-20, uh, actually in the room to say, hey, what does ERC-1400 need to look like, which is going to be backwards compatible with ERC-20. And so that, that was a really cool event that we had, um, just hearing from all these different all these different aspects of capital markets and what their concerns are and how things need to function. And, oh, have you not heard about this law yet? You know, that's uh, likely going to pass next week. Um, and so all those really interesting perspectives are, are what make ERC-1400 so great. And that's obviously part of the reason why Coinbase wanted to onboard them um, and work with ERC-1400 tokens. But then I, th I think the really cool thing is ERC-1400 is what inspired us to actually build their own blockchain. And it's a lot of what inspires the architecture for Polymesh is ensuring that we can have all of that same functionality, ensuring that we take with us all of those different perspectives of what a custodian needs, what a broker dealer needs, what a KYC provider needs, and how they can all really, really easily plug into a blockchain to offer their own services on top of that blockchain where we take care of how the blockchain works. They don't have to figure out consensus mechanisms. They don't have to figure out how to keep nodes online and they don't have to figure out how staking is going to work. Um, all they have to do is focus on their best in class services on top of the base layer blockchain that we build. I want to talk about Polymesh a little bit too now. So I know we've touched on it, but I want to go a little bit deeper as much as we could. So um, just for those who don't know, Polymath, Polymath announced in uh, 2021 that Polymesh uh, would be launched by the Polymesh Association on, on October 13th, 2021. So the launch of Polymesh, October 13th, 2021. So like, what is Polymesh? Polymesh uh, was purpose built to incorporate identity, compliance, confidentiality, governance, and deterministic finality, as Graham said, in a public blockchain setting. Through key design principles built into the chain's core, Polymesh solves issues with public infrastructure and provides for the first time a chain built from the ground up to be compatible with capital market needs. In addition, Polymesh's native protocol token, PolyX, is a utility token under Swiss laws based on guidance provided by the Swiss financial regulator, FINMA. This marks a big step towards big step forward in regulatory understanding of blockchain technology and its potential beyond payments and securities. So as Chris Hauser, interim CEO of Polymath said at the time, Polymath set out to build the world's first blockchain specifically for security tokens in 2019. And we've achieved that and more. We're excited to announce the Polymesh mainnet launch by the Polymesh Association, especially after the community's passionate response to the in incentivized testnet, which had over 4,300 users. So can you tell us more about Polymesh that we haven't touched on yet? Yeah, I, I think the, the Polymesh Association is a big one there. Um, and then also FINMA's ruling. Uh, so the, associ the association, the Polymesh Association is a member-based association. It's a not-for-profit based in Switzerland. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of blockchain projects choose Switzerland as their sort of home base. Uh, and the reason being is Switzerland has been very, very friendly in terms of how they want to regulate this space. Um, and in particular, they have decided uh, based on a ruling and you know of course uh legal asterisks everywhere this is their current ruling it could change us any point you know all, all, all of that kind of uh legal speak um their opinion was that polyx is a utility token and so not a lot of regulators around the world have that definition squarely baked into a regulatory framework yet and so in the us it's more create a token see what happens, maybe we'll sue you at some point and say that it's a security and you didn't file properly. Um, and so how Switzerland takes that approach is they actually have three different categories of tokens. One category is a currency or payment token. So that would be something like Bitcoin, for example. 
Then they have something that is a called an asset token or security. Obviously, stocks, bonds, etc. The things that we help people create and manage, those are securities. And then they have this third bucket called utility tokens, which is what PolyX is. So the native protocol token of the chain. Um, th that's generally what you're going to see Finma designate as uh, utility tokens. And of course, I can't speak for Finma, but that's what we've seen. Um, you know, so these types of protocol tokens that are required that are generated through either proof of work or proof of stake, those are generally what, what we would see as utility tokens that are necessary for a network to function. And so it was really, really great to see Finma uh, have that opinion of PolyX. Um, of course, that's that's part of the reason why, why we went to Switzerland. And then also we've just seen Finma also be on the forefront of security tokens as well. Um, so we're really, really excited about, about the Polymesh Association being in, in Switzerland. Um, and then on top of that, in terms of Polymesh, um, you mentioned uh, Chris's quote about the ITN. Uh, so we had an incentivized testnet, which ran for about five months before mainnet launch. So if, for anybody who doesn't know, an incentivized testnet is how you can get users using your technology, trying to break it, you know, see what happens when 3,000 3, people are trying to click the same button at the same time. You know, are your, are your load speeds accurate? Are, are they up to date? Um, is there any copy you know, that's even written wrong? Uh, things all of that nature. So we had over 4,000 users on our incentivized testnet who were testing out the blockchain, helping us break things, helping us make Polymesh the best that it could be. Um, so that was really, really cool to see. And now we have a lot of those users that have now onboarded on mainnet as well. Um, so there are you know, thousands of users on Polymesh at this point, all again, primarily now they've onboarded, they've either, um, and a lot of what they've done at this point is staked their PolyX to provide security to the network and also earn rewards. And so another thing I think that's worth mentioning is people might be familiar with Poly. So Poly is the ERC20 token that we created uh, back in 2018. And so you can actually take a Poly token and you can upgrade it to PolyX. So there's an upgrade bridge that we've created where it's a one for one bridge. So if I have 30 Poly, I can then upgrade it and I will get 30 PolyX on the Polymesh side of things. And then I can stake that PolyX to earn rewards and help secure the network. So that's kind of the, the nitty gritty 30,000 uh, foot view uh, of Polymesh, you know, blockchain for security tokens, started building it when we realized institutions demanded more out of what blockchains could provide for them, specifically for regulated assets. And it's now live. And if anyone wants to go use it, I, I definitely recommend they go check it out. The Poly X website looks pretty epic. That's all which, which website is that? Polyxtoken.com? No, actually, so, so good thing. Oh, uh, yeah, got it. Up. it up. That yeah. is not, yeah, that is not us. Um, so, of course, as everyone's familiar uh, in the blockchain space, there are uh, a lot of scams. Um, and a lot of things impersonating other things um, and people creating tokens, hoping to get rich quickly. Um, so yeah, so that is not us. Um, do not click that. Do not buy anything there. Um, do not give anyone your seed phrase on that website or anything like that. Um, we're, uh, we're desperately trying to get CoinGecko, which I see has a page for that, uh, to either change that or do something. Um, so if anyone knows anyone at CoinGecko, give them a ping uh, for us. I can, uh, I might be able to help you with that. So uh, I, so I can launch a, a security token on Polymath, which would then be able to short this uh, other PolyX, right? Just kidding. Just <laughs> yeah. kidding. Uh, potentially, maybe. Okay. So with our last few minutes here, I, I want to speak on uh, economic issues. I know you're you're very you studied economics. You're very adept at economics. Now, I think even since the last time we spoke, if I'm not mistaken, um, inflation has become an even bigger buzzword than it already had been. I had identified that inflation would be a big buzzword moving forward at Bitcoin conference 2021, because everyone there was talking about inflation and it was a hot topic at that conference. And then moving forward, now we're in November 26 and it seems that uh, inflation has gone from transitory to pop culture. So now, now how this relates to poly math, I think is that a lot of um, investors will hold hard assets in order to um, offset the effects of inflation or to avoid being in inflationary assets altogether. They do this through real estate and other commodities as well. So real estate, commodities, Bitcoin nowadays, gold, silver, uh, numerous uh, strategies in order to be in uh, non-inflationary assets that would benefit in a inflationary environment, agriculture. So with polymath and some of the uh, use cases we talked today, you can actually like 
own a share of a real building, for instance, or perhaps a, a commodity even? Can you kind of speak to the ability of uh, security tokens and, and holders of security tokens to protect themselves from inflation? And then also, where do you see inflation going? Yeah, cash flowing and hard assets have always been something that I've been obsessed with uh, my entire life. And so as, as soon as you kind of learn in school, okay, well, the money gets created and then it keeps getting created and the money buys less stuff over time. Why would you ever hold the money? You know, why would you ever hold the government currency? It doesn't make any sense. The global reserve currency changes roughly every hundred years. Um, so even if you have the global reserve currency, um, it, it is going to go down in value and it's going to become worthless at some point, or at least next to worthless. You know, since the Federal Reserve was created, US dollars lost over 96% of its value, whatever that number is. Um, and so I've, I've always hated cash, always my whole entire life. As soon as I could open you know, a self-directed investing account, I started, I started investing and I started taking every single dollar that I had that I didn't need for day-to-day -day spending and investing it in stocks. And people are going to do the same thing with security tokens. You know, they already are. And the idea with security tokens is they're not necessarily different from securities that exist today. It's just a different infrastructure that they live on top of. You know, whether a security is uh, written down on a napkin that says you own five shares in my company, like, thanks, take this, this is legally binding and we both sign. Um, or it's a piece of paper sitting in a lawyer's filing cabinet somewhere, or it's on an Excel spreadsheet, or it's in a cap table management software, or if it's on a blockchain, you know, Owning assets that either pay cash flows and or are hard assets that cannot be inflated is, in my opinion, always a good idea. Now, of course, there are extenuating circumstances where cash can outperform for short periods of time. You know, mass depressions, for example, um, 1930s, um, 2008, obviously cash outperformed for a few months there. Um, but over long periods of time, holding hard assets and holding assets that pay cash flows is the most important thing in the whole entire world. If you want any chance of becoming financially free or at least moderately wealthy in, in life, when the cash gets devalued every single second of every day. And it, it's, it, it actually kind of, kind of hurts me that, that so many people don't understand this topic. Um, you know, people I know that are relatively intelligent, you know, they've gone to university, they're supposed to be quote smart, you know, um, and just having a hundred thousand dollars in a bank account, no, with no assets. You know, I, I just go, what? I don't understand what you are doing. You know, next next year that buys ninety eight thousand dollars worth of goods, and then next year it buys ninety five thousand dollars worth of goods, and then ninety thousand, then eighty five thousand, and you're just losing value. You're losing purchasing power every second that you don't own a hard asset, and instead you hold government currency that gets created on a schedule determined by nine people sitting in a boardroom somewhere. You know, it, it's absolutely insane to me that financial literacy is not taught more seriously in, in the educational system. Um, and, and that's one reason why I love shows like this, you know, is, is I get a chance to kind of yell about that from the rooftops and hopefully someone will listen and, and maybe go, you know, if it's buying $10 of gold instead of holding $10 cash in their Venmo account or whatever it is, you know, just go purchase something that at least has the opportunity to be worth more, more value in the future. You know, rather than something that's guaranteed to go down every single second of every day. So inflation, I think the number everybody's quoting right now is 6% um, from October. You know, I think it's more than that, right? And so we see people posting photos like this every single day where something that they used to buy that was $4 is now $7 or something they used to buy that was 30 bucks is now $80. Um, Dollar Tree announced that all of their $1 items will now be $1.25 and it's never going back. And so that's 25% inflation, you know, but the number we're being quoted is 6%, you know, based on what? Well, whoever creates the CPI can decide whatever's in the CPI and they can change that at any point they want to make the numbers sound better. It's the same way that, you know, China just goal seeks the GDP print. You know, if China wants GDP to be 8%, they just change the number in the Excel spreadsheet and they say, okay, it's 8%. You know, same thing with the CPI in the United States and with pretty much any country in the world, they just decide what CPI is going to print um, based on the inputs. And so I know I'm kind of rambling here and, and just kind of going off on, on a tangent, but main point here is it's so important to hold assets that are not government currency. And whether the assets are going to be the best performing things in the whole entire world, who knows, you know, and maybe you'll even lose a tiny bit of money. Uh, maybe you'll even lose a lot of money, but at least you, at least you tried. 
you know, at least you tried to not watch your wealth be destroyed by government bureaucrats that are deciding how much wealth they want to have. Um, so that, that, that's kind of my end of rant, I think. All the wealth. They want all the wealth. So yes. can you uh, tell me now, uh, now security tokens, how does security tokens help people perhaps hedge from this environment? Yeah, uh, because security tokens can represent a piece of real estate. They can represent a stock. They can represent a bond. Um, they can represent a revenue share agreement. They can represent a piece of land somewhere that's producing uh, cash flows uh, when, it, when it creates uh, corn and sells corn or broccoli and sells broccoli. You know, so having any type of security, whether it's a security token or not, um, can be an inflation hedge. Just something that is not purely cash sitting in a bank account doing absolutely nothing or you know, earning the 0.1% that's being offered at banks these days where inflation is reported to be 6%, but I think all of us kind of know instinctively that it's much higher than that. Um, just holding something other than cash, security tokens is obviously a great way to get exposure uh, to that inflation hedge. Let's open up Bitcoin Tree where all the products in per perpetuity get <laughs> cheaper and cheaper. So we've had the honor of sitting down today with Graham Moore. Are you the VP of tokenization at Polymath? So, so I've been the VP of marketing, head of tokenization. So currently I'm the head of tokenization, which, you know, I wear a bunch of different hats still, you know, marketing, uh, customer success, product, um, business development. Um, but yeah, currently uh, my title is the head of tokenization. Graham Moore of Polymath, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. And thank you everyone for listening.